Walt Disney World, the most magical place on Earth, and a place where the 50-plus year history starts with a spy-like mission led by a founder of the CIA to secretly acquire land in Florida. At its heart, though, the story of the Walt Disney World Resort is really the story of two brothers, Walt and Roy Disney, and their plans to not just build a theme park destination, but a city, a town, and more. And ultimately, how one brother on the verge of retirement would go back to working full-time to make his brother's final wish come true. So in celebration of Walt Disney World's 50th anniversary, let's take a look back and see how Disney managed to turn 27,000 acres of swampland into the vacation kingdom of the world. For review time, I'm Luke, and this is the in-depth history of the construction of the Walt Disney World Resort. On July 17, 1955, Disneyland opened and showed the world what a Disney theme park was like. But Disney wasn't the only one who wanted a piece of that pie. What was once Orange Groves quickly became not just a theme park, but a collection of sketchy hotels, liquor stores and tacky souvenir shops right outside the gates to Walt's Magic Kingdom. Disneyland was a victim of its own success. Walt's struggles to acquire funding for the project meant he was only able to purchase enough land for his park, the car park, and a third-party hotel, meaning other businesses bought land right outside to feed off Disney's success. This was instantly one of Walt's biggest regrets when it came to Disneyland. As he said, one of the things I've learned from Disneyland is to control the environment. Without that, we get blamed for the things that someone else does. The thing Walt loved most about his theme park is that it was a living, breathing experience. It wasn't like a film where you would send out the final copy and that was it. Nothing more could be changed. Walt loved the fact that Disneyland could grow. He could keep plussing it with ideas and over time it could become something completely different. In the first three years of operation, Disneyland would welcome over 10 million visitors, with over two thirds of them coming from California and only around 8% coming from east of the Mississippi River. By now, Walt was getting antsy. He wanted to fix all the problems that Disneyland had, but the locked in nature of the park wouldn't allow it. Businessmen from all over the world were knocking on Walt's doorstep asking him to build a Disneyland park in their hometown or country, willing to completely pick up the bill if Walt would build it for them. Disney would turn down offers from all over the world, including Japan, West Palm Beach, and even St. Louis, Missouri, a park we've covered in our video on Walt Disney's Riverfront Square. Harrison Buzz Price, the man who picked the location for Disneyland, was brought back on board and tasked with searching America for the perfect place for Walt's second theme park. Walt's mandate was as follows. Buy a lot of land between five and 10,000 acres, a fair bit more than Disneyland's 160. He also didn't want to be too close to the ocean competing with beaches, stating, we'll make our own lakes and waterways where we want them. A study in 1959 listed Florida as a prime location for a future Disney project, with a further study two years later splitting the state into five regions, with Central Florida coming out on top as the most favorable location. Walt wasn't so sure though, and was worried an East Coast audience wouldn't embrace a Disney park, with him already saying no to plans in Niagara Falls and New Jersey. In the mid-1960s, Walt was presented with the perfect place to test market his concepts on an East Coast audience, and for very little out-of-pocket expense. The 1964-65 New York World's Fair would see four attractions built by Walt and his team, all paid for by corporate sponsors, such as Pepsi and UNICEF's It's a Small World, Ford's Magic Skyway, and General Electric's Carousel of Progress. This proved to be a low-cost way to build and develop attractions that would ultimately find their way back to Disneyland, but also showed the East Coast's acceptance and desire for Disney-styled entertainment. 51.6 million people visited the World's Fair, 
and 47 million of them experienced a Disney attraction within. While Walt was preparing attractions for the New York World's Fair, he was still actively on the hunt for land for his next theme park venture. On November 17, 1963, Walt and his executives boarded a private jet to fly around potential locations in the Sunshine State. After a week or so of scouring, they entered the plane to head back home. But Walt instructed the pilot to fly low so he could get a good view of the land. That's it, exclaimed Walt as he looked down to see major highways come together. He saw I-4, I-95, and the Sunshine State Parkway. Proximity to these highways was perfect, allowing for access to the location from pretty much anywhere on the East Coast. A few days later, Walt and Roy called together a small team for a top secret meeting of his most trusted executives. Walt set down the criteria for this highly classified mission. The team was to find a site within Walt's specified area near Orlando of usable, non-swamp land between 5 and 10,000 acres with access to a major highway system. The most important part of this mission, though, was that it must be done in absolute secrecy. If the media and the general public heard that Disney was looking to buy huge parcels of land in Florida, the price for those parcels would surely skyrocket. Disney even implemented a rerouting system for phone calls so that they would appear to be coming from New York rather than California. Robert Bob Foster would head the official land search and after scouring through US geological surveys and tax assessor maps, Foster was able to narrow down the list of properties to around 16 that would be perfect for Disney's needs. The issue was, many of these 16 would likely be difficult to purchase, as they were already large, working orange groves, turning a tidy profit year after year. Foster headed to Orlando to talk to landowners and obtain options on the property if possible, which would lock them into the sale of that land to Disney and no one else. Disney at any time though could pull out if their circumstances changed. Disney worked on the project with one of their most trusted legal advisory firms, Donovan Leisure, Newton and Irvine, who were perfectly apt at keeping secrets as their founder, William J. Donovan, was the man who founded the CIA during World War II. Disney didn't just hire any old lawyer from the firm to help them out either, bringing on board Paul Halliwell, a fellow member of that original team of CIA agents. Disney's land-seeking secret was surely safe with a man whose life involved keeping national secrets safe. Foster and Helliwell continued to whittle down the potential properties from that original 16 to just a handful. As was often the case when working with Walt though, the one from that handful he wanted was the most difficult to acquire as although a large portion of the land was owned by a single family, bits and pieces of that land had been subdivided into five acre blocks and sold off between 1911 and 1913 through mail order advertisements for a $5 down payment and $5 per month. Most of the properties sold under this Munger Farms development plans were unusable and inaccessible, meaning many of the people who bought these pieces of property never saw them, and reaching out to every single one of them over 50 years after they bought the parcel of land was going to be incredibly difficult and time consuming. But of course, being Walt's favorite choice, he got his way, and they started placing offers on the land. After a 12 hour meeting of in-depth back and forth between Disney and the owners of this parcel of land, Bill and Jack Demetries, Disney was finally able to secure an option on the property for a $25,000 down payment. They would then have six months exclusivity to buy the parcel for $145 an acre. With the Dimitris none the wiser, it was Disney they were potentially selling their property to. The six month option gave Disney time to attempt to purchase not just the small Munger Farm parcels of land on the property, but also the underground rights to the land. Florida at the time had separated the above and below ground land rights as the Florida phosphorus mines were providing over 80% of the US's phosphorus, 
used to create things such as matches and fireworks. Without the ownership of both the land and mineral rights, a separate underground rights owner could acquire the mineral rights, come in and just blow up everything below ground, no matter what happened to the surface rights owner's property above. Probably not a great thing to happen to your family theme park. After some initial pushback from Tufts, the mineral rights owners, they were ultimately convinced to sell their underground parcels to Disney for $15,000. After they were shown via geographical surveys that the ground had essentially no useful phosphorus or oil underneath. The purchase of these mineral rights seemed promising, but Walt was still worried another California situation would be on his hands if he didn't acquire even more land. Disney would also acquire the Bay Lake property, a 1,250-acre property containing the lake still known today as Bay Lake for $250,000, as well as the Hamrick Tract, with a further 2,700 acres purchased for $623,523 precisely. The next challenge was to acquire all the small, subdivided Munger Farms parcels spread throughout the Demetri estate. Tracking down the landowners via telephone, mail, or even just showing up to their last known address, Foster slowly but surely acquired the land back, with one person only agreeing to sell after the official announcement of the project, if she got a lifetime pass to Disneyland and Walt Disney World thrown in. Disney would eventually acquire 65 of these smaller properties at around $350 an acre. Ultimately, Walt's dream of five to 10,000 acres came true and then some, when they eventually purchased over 27,000 acres of property in the heart of central Florida, roughly twice the size of Manhattan. Paying in cash so it couldn't be as easily traced, Disney spent around $5 million total, equaling under $200 per acre on average. Walt was happy. No other businesses would back onto his land. He had no roads, no power lines, and no utilities. A completely blank slate to construct everything exactly the way he wanted. All of this land would be secretly acquired thanks to Foster and Heliwell, as well as some cleverly named shell companies Disney would hide behind, including Bay Lake Properties, Reedy Creek Ranch Lands, and my personal favorite, Empty Lot. The rumor mill was cycling around, pointing from aviation companies to car manufacturers and more. But on the 15th of November, 1965, Walt, Roy, and the governor of Florida would officially announce it was Disney all along who had been purchasing these plots of land. Walt didn't give many specifics about the property, timeframes, or expected expenditure, but it was finally official. The small town of Orlando was about to welcome the giant of Disney. This over 27,000 acres gave Walt a lot more space than was required to build a single theme park. So he turned his brain instead onto the huge, completely new project of urban planning. Not trying to fix the problems he found with urbanization, but instead recreate the idea of a city from its core. Thoughts such as, who needs a car when you have a citywide people mover would be the driving points for his experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Epcot became Walt's true Florida project, not the Disney theme park. This city was set to be his magnum opus. Four decades of business and six decades of life condensed into one project. Walt needed to convince the state of Florida of his ideas though. Disney needed absolute legal control of their newly purchased property and asked the state of Florida to do something they hadn't done before, grant governmental powers to a private company. Disney's first movements towards this were with the creation of the Reedy Creek Drainage District, which allowed Disney to control and move excess water around the property and made 20,000 of its 27,000 acres of land now usable for construction by dredging over 50 miles of canals through the property. This drainage district was just a foot in the door for Disney, truly controlling their land though, as they wanted to control a lot more than just water. 
They wanted to control their own roads, airports, mosquito control systems, and just about everything else. Disney was happy to completely pay for these things if they were given complete sovereignty of the land. Walt Disney himself would lay out the plans best when he hosted The Florida Project, a 24-minute film breaking down his grandiose plans for Orlando. But the most exciting, the far, the most important part of our Florida project, in fact, the heart of everything we'll be doing in Disney World will be our experimental prototype city of tomorrow. We call it Epcot, spelled E-P-C-O-T, experimental, prototype, community of tomorrow. Here it is in larger scale. Epcot will take its cue from the new ideas and new technologies that are now emerging from the creative centers of American industry. It will be a community of tomorrow that will never be completed, but will always be introducing and testing and demonstrating new materials and new systems. And Epcot will always be a showcase to the world for the ingenuity and imagination of American free enterprise. Five days after filming the Florida project, Walt Disney was admitted to St. Joseph's Hospital. And a month later on the 15th of December, 1966, Walt Disney would pass away from circulatory collapse caused by lung cancer. The Epcot film was Walt's second last time on camera and one of his most passionate performances ever. Walt's death could have easily been the end of the entire Florida plans. But his older brother Roy, who was just about to retire, had one last job to finish. Make sure his brother's final dream came true. Roy had no idea if he could do it, but he was going to try his damn best, telling executives, we're gonna finish this project and we're gonna do it just the way Walt wanted. Don't you ever forget it. I want every one of you to do just exactly what you were going to do when Walt was alive. One of Roy's first motions showed the importance of this project to his brother's legacy, officially changing the name from Disney World to Walt Disney World. So every person who entered was reminded of the legacy of the genius who made it all possible. Roy took over pitching to the state of Florida as his brother's dreams couldn't go ahead without Disney owning the authority on the land. Disney proposed the Reedy Creek Improvement District, which basically gave Disney complete legal power and control over its land. Drainage, utilities, sewerage systems, construction, public transport, fire, airports, EMS, essentially everything. But what did Florida have to gain by signing off all these rights usually reserved for governments? Walt Disney World in its first 10 years alone was expected to generate $6.6 .6 billion in measurable economic benefits for Florida. Tourism, employment, and therefore taxes would all be up. On April 17, 1967, the Disney legislation was overwhelmingly passed by the Floridian government. Disney had received its improvement district a district that today still employs over 300 full-time staff. On the 30th of May, 1967, ground would officially break on the Walt Disney World project. Original estimates put the cost of construction at around $100 million, with about a third of that being covered by corporate sponsorships. Some of the first brands on board included Smuckers and even Coca-Cola, who is still on board as a sponsor today 50 years later. However, the $40,000 to $100,000 Disney was getting for each of these sponsorships was nowhere near enough to cover the constantly ballooning project costs, which ultimately ended up at nearly $400 million, which was raised through loans, bonds, and stock options, which were all completely paid off by the time the park opened. One of Walt's wishes that would ultimately come true was the placement of the Magic Kingdom theme park towards the back of the property, designed to drive people through Epcot City on their way to the park. Just outside this new theme park would be one of the largest projects completed before opening, the waterways. First, Bay Lake, the already existing lake on the property was drained, 
cleaned and had its sand taken from the seabed and spread around to make artificial beaches. Connecting to Bay Lake right in front of the park was the Seven Seas Lagoon, a completely man-made 200-acre body of water. The Seven Seas Lagoon fulfilled several needs. First, it separated the park from the transportation and ticketing center, giving Disney full control over your entrance to the park, either via monorail or boat. More importantly though, the dirt was used to create the famed Utilidors, or Utility Corridors, the true ground floor of the Magic Kingdom, with the park being essentially on level one, above ground level. Underneath guests' feet is another world of cast members, services, and a distinct smell that will likely never leave my nose. The Utilidors also fixed one of Walt's most hated parts of Disneyland, the fact a spaceman could be seen walking to his work location through Adventureland. At the Magic Kingdom, cast members could stealthily make their way through the Utilidors to their work location, only coming on stage in their land and area. The first building to open on the property was the Walt Disney World Preview Center on January 10th, 1970. Designed to give potential future visitors to the resort a sneak peek at what was to come through a short film and huge impressive scale model of the resort. And of course, being Disney, there was also a snack bar, merchandise location and place to buy tickets to the upcoming theme park. With over $11 million worth of tickets to the Magic Kingdom pre-sold via the preview center before the park had opened its gates. While today Disney is struggling to attract enough cast members to work at the resort, in the year leading up to the opening of Walt Disney World, almost 4,000 people a week inquired about employment. Of the 120,000 applications that were received, 35,000 were interviewed and only 5,000 made the cut. Of course, the vacation kingdom of the world needed more than just one theme park. So two hotels were also planned for the opening of this new resort. Disney though, wasn't in the hotel industry. Disney enlisted US Steel to pay for and construct the hotels, budgeting around $60 million to build the Polynesian and the Contemporary. After the construction, Disney would lease and operate the hotels from them for a yearly fee. Both hotels were set to be built using a brand new modular construction concept, where full hotel rooms were built off-site, containing everything from lights to bathroom utilities and even a bed, and then slotted into the hotel structure on site. Disney wasn't happy with the speeds US Steel was moving at, and ultimately just ended up buying them out, so they would work for and under Disney's guidelines, meaning they would open up perfectly on time with the rest of the resort. Countless times throughout the project, it looked as if Disney wasn't going to be ready to open on time. On the eve of Disney World's opening, it was truly all hands on deck. The now 78-year-old Roy Disney was unpacking trucks, and a helicopter was even brought in to hover above the Magic Kingdom to help dry the cement quicker. Four years, nine months, and 16 days after Walt's passing, his Magic Kingdom at the Walt Disney World Resort would open to guests. Predicted crowd levels were 30 to 35,000 people, but by the end of the day, only just over 11,000 guests had entered. This wasn't an issue though, as Disney officially called this the preview period, with the park being officially dedicated by Roy a few weeks later on October 25th. Walt Disney World is a tribute to the philosophy and the life of Walter Elias Disney, and to the talents, the dedication, and the loyalty of the entire Disney organization that made Walt Disney's dream come true. May Walt Disney World bring joy and inspiration and new knowledge to all who come to this happy place, a magic kingdom where the young at heart of all ages can laugh and play and learn together. Dedicated this 25th day of October, 1971. An estimated 52 million people across the United States tuned in to watch the opening celebration on TV, around one in every four Americans. 
A month after opening on November 26, the Magic Kingdom welcomed over 55,000 guests, a new record. And in the first four months of operation, over 2 million people walked through the gates. Less than three months after the opening of Walt Disney World, Roy Oliver Disney would pass away from a stroke on December 20th, 1971, at the age of 78. Five years and five days since his brother had passed in the same hospital. Two brothers, poor farm boys from the Midwest had done it, left a legacy on the world that is still being felt by countless people every single year. While Disney never did get around to building that city they promised Florida, I can't imagine the state is too angry at them, as Orlando is now the most visited destination in the United States, the theme park capital of the world. Disney World employs over 70,000 people at its peak, and with a daily population spread between the parks, nearing 200,000 people in the busy season, it's crazy to think how that spy-like dream of secretly buying up property in Florida turned out. While it's easy to look at the Walt Disney World Resort today and be worried about its future with things like Genie Plus and Lightning Lane, to me, the Magic Kingdom will always have a special place in my heart. It's the park I was lucky enough to work in for over a year, and it's easily the park I'll spend the most hours in across my life. 50 years on from opening and we'd love to wish a big happy birthday to the Walt Disney World Resort and the Magic Kingdom Park, the park that Roy built. If you are interested in even more detail on this incredible story, make sure to check out the Buying Disney's World book by Aaron H. Goldberg. He goes into more detail than I ever could. From the home of all things theme parks, I'm Luke for Review Time. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Review Time. If so, be sure to like and subscribe, and also check out our podcast, Review Time's Theme Park Cast, available on your podcasting platform of choice.